Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Peter Holland. I'm the Associate Dean for the Arts in the College of Arts and Letters. Uh, and it's my most enjoyable duty uh, every year to organize the Saturday Scholars Series. And here we are at the end of what I think has been a, a fine semester of talks with the one that I think, frankly, is the one I've been looking forward to most. Uh, on an unseasonably warm day in November, unbelievable good football weather for September but I'll take this for November uh, I'm very glad that you've torn yourselves away from the sunshine to come in Brina Nick uh, is uh, the oh, let me get her title right the Thomas J and Kathleen O'Donnell professor of Irish language and literature uh, and she's also a concurrent professor in my home department film television and theater in spring 2006, she made her first visit to Notre Dame. She was a visiting professor and brought here the great contemporary Irish poet, uh, Nuala Nihonal. During that same semester, she learned that her own critical book on, on Nuala and on other poets had won the Merriman Prize for Irish Language Academic Book of the Year. She left the visiting professorship at Notre Dame and returned to Ireland where she carried on as an, uh, her academic writing, but also her ongoing work as a script writer in film and television. She's written over, 40, uh, sorry, over 35 screenplays and 10 documentaries and won in 2007 the television program of the year uh, in Ireland. Her winning documentary, which she wrote and directed, tracked the career of an early leader in the Irish language movement and Sean Noss Singer, somebody who died in obscurity in London and who Brina needed, and rightly so, to bring back to our attention. She came back here in 2007-8 uh, as the inaugural Senior Fulbright Fellow, sponsored both by the United States Department of State but also uh, by uh, the Republic of Ireland. And she joined the permanent faculty here in 2008, and we've been very, very fortunate to have her here ever since. For the last while, working towards a deadline that is absolutely immovable, she's been at work creating a multi-part documentary series on the Easter Rising. The deadline is immovable because it has to be ready for Easter 2016, so that it can be broadcast on public television in Ireland and internationally. And she's going to talk to us today about the whole process of turning archive into documentary. I'd like you to welcome Brina Nikiamida. Technically? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Oh, yes, I have this, so I'm going to. Uh until my legs turn to jelly, at least I'll wander a little bit, and then perhaps seek the comfort and support of the lectern. Um, it's, thank you so much, Peter. That was, um, it's really funny when you're sitting down there hearing about yourself and you don't recognize yourself. You know? But anyway, um, and it's, uh, you, you were so good to come to this morning. It's such a beautiful, beautiful day out there. This is such a beautiful campus, and aren't we very lucky? Um, just before, I just would like, just for, very, very briefly, just to turn our, our minds just to Paris, and again, just if we can send our thoughts and prayers to the victims of that dreadful, dreadful thing. Paris, I know, is close to many of us, and um, what can you say? So, um, this morning, what I'd like to talk to you about is uh, the 1916 Rebellion. Not so much the 1916 Rebellion as an event, but what we are calling the 1916 Irish Rebellion, which is a series, which is a documentary series. Uh, we also have uh, an 80 minute feature version of that. We also have a companion book to that. So six years ago, I began <clears throat> speaking with Professor Christopher Fox's, uh, got out of his uh, Saturday morning routine to come here. I'm very glad to see him. And uh, this talk wouldn't be possible without, uh, without uh, Chris. This entire project would not have been possible without Chris and the 100% support of the Keogh Norton Institute for Irish Studies here at Notre Dame. And even though I am a fellow of that institute, um, I have no compunction in saying it is the leading program in the world. It is a pleasure, privilege, and honor to be associated with it. Um, and this is a great university. I mean, I've been a documentary maker, I've been an academic. 
But to be able to use the resources of, the, of this university, to be able to go to our sponsors, our donors, and say, we have this great idea. To be able to go to the university itself and say, we have this, what we think is a great idea. We want to do for Irish history, and specifically for 1916, the Irish Rebellion, which is the seminal, seminal event in modern and contemporary Irish history. To do for that what Ken Burns managed to do for American history with his amazing series, The Civil War. And that is, what did he do with that? Well, what I felt he did with that was that he took something that was still quite controversial, still quite a painful memory for the US and for people in America on all sides. Uh, something that still pained people, that was still there, that could still cause controversy. And give it back to the people in an incredibly serious fashion, but also in a very authentic fashion and in an incredibly intimate fashion. So I went to Chris, we were talking about what would, what would we do next, and I said, uh, let's do that. Let's see, can we do for Irish history what Ken Burns did for the civil wars here and, and other things, obviously. Baseball is now doing a series in Vietnam. And Chris said in his inimitable fashion, absolutely, let's do it. Go Irish, and we did. <laughs> and uh, this was like an idea, you know, we needed to raise quite a substantial amount of money. We needed to uh, obviously convince people uh, at all levels, people who would give us money, people who would give us the permission, give us time, give us resources, talk to us, share their scholarship with us, and some of those are here too, Professor Tom Bartlett, who is a professor, who is a professor in Aberdeen, and who is one of our contributors, a visiting professor here at the moment. Uh, he and, and many others, and indeed our own faculty, at least five or six of our own history faculty here, uh, uh, contributed their time, effort, uh, were so generous with sharing their scholarship with us. And we have managed to do that. We have now, I can stand here in front of you and say, we have now completed a three one hour, three by one hour series, uh, which will be shown on public television stations throughout the states, coast to coast. We think we have 100 stations. We were in, down in Atlanta on last Tuesday at the television marketplace, and we had a great buzz, you know. People were coming up and saying, this is wonderful. When can we show this? And so they will be showing this hopefully next March, as I say, throughout the States. Uh, in Ireland, the Irish uh, National Broadcaster, RTE, has taken it on board. They entered into partnership with us. It is going to be, the three part is going to be the main, their main uh, stay of the centenary program because of course next year as you know is 2016 and it's the centenary of the rising and that's what we were aiming for um, so so we, we've and I think we've done it I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased we've also had the great fortune of having the Irish government take this project on board in a very incredibly generous way uh, mind you we're helping them as well because what they wanted to do in the centenary was involve the diaspora and there are 40 million people in the US, according to the US Census, who say they're Irish. So that is a fairly hefty diaspora. Then there's probably 30, 000, 30 million more spread throughout the world. Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Uh, and they're just the Anglophone countries. So Ireland is a tiny little place, but we punch above our weight. Yeah, we, in, many, in, in many things, we punch above our weight. And this, this, what could have been a tiny event in 1916, Think when this happened, this happened halfway through the First World War. The biggest carnage that the world had ever seen. Warfare on an industrial scale, millions were dying. And this event, this tiny little event, where less than 2,000 men and women went out in Dublin, took on the might of the British Empire in the middle of the First World War, a stab in the back in the eyes of many. Uh, 500,000 Irish men were fighting in the trenches at the same time, remember, on behalf in the British Army, fighting, as they saw in their lives, for Ireland as well. And yet this tiny event, they were beaten, obviously, 20,000 troops by the end of the week, 20,000 troops came into Dublin and crushed them. They arrested the leaders, they executed 16. Within a short period of time, things had completely turned over. Public opinion, they, they made a moral victory out of military defeat. And out of military defeat, they went on to achieve independence in a number of years after that. But they proclaimed an Irish Republic again, in, in a way that no one would ever have expected them to do so. 
So that was the story we wanted to tell. And that, that's that tiny little story, as I say. That story appeared on the front page of the New York Times for 16 consecutive days during Easter 1916. Can you think of any event now that would, that would put things to the back of, the, that, would, that would dominate coverage in that way, front page coverage? And when we were filming with Professor Bob Schmuel, one of our professors here, Professor of American Studies, uh, we filmed in New, York, in New York, in the New York Times, down in the archive, they call it the morgue, quite an incredible place actually. And they still have the old microfiche and we can still go in and take out the papers, they were fantastic to us. So we were in there filming, but to actually see, to physically see the newspaper, and to see in the centre of this, events in Dublin, dramatic events in Dublin, rebels killed, blah de blah, and then on the side and the inside pages, thousands are killed in France. Uh, bombings in England, the, the, the Germans are bombing the coastal cities. Are, and you think, but how, why then is this dominating? Why is this small little story dominating? So these were some things we wanted to uncover in this. We didn't want just to tell the story again, but we wanted to particularly hone in on why was this a world story? And we firmly believe that it is a world story. It's obviously an Irish story, it's a British story, but if you pull back, and this is, I suppose, as an Irish person, who's come to work and live over here in, 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 in the States, um, you get a different perspective. And I suppose, in a, in, a, in a sense, looking at the events of 1916, which are still quite controversial, um, how do we look at them? Do we go back and look at them in a way that I think we've often done in Ireland, which is simply Ireland and Britain? This very insular way of looking at Irish history, Irish and British history. Or do we pull back and say, Okay, 1916, what was happening in the world? What was happening in Europe? And in particular, what was happening in America? Because that part of the story, the story of Irish-American involvement in the Rising is one that has not been told properly. And it's one that I think, and I hope, and that certainly, certainly we hope to do, and I think we have achieved that, is to tell it properly. Is to put back in again to that story all the bits that were missing. Without Irish-America, 1916 would not have happened. It's a fairly bold statement, and it's a true statement. I hope I'm up there at the back, who is the, the uh, historian, would agree with that. But, I, but again, just speaking to all of these people that we interviewed, 35 top historians, time and again, they said, the seedbed of 1916 was in the US. Podrick Pierce, who was the leader of the main, if we think back, who was the, who was the spiritual leader of 1916, as well as the actual leader, it was Podrick Pierce. Podrick Pierce found his revolutionary voice in the US. He met John Devoy, the old Fenian who'd come over here, and he went back impassioned in fire. And Irish America provided the oxygen, the logistics, the inspiration for what happened in Dublin. So again, that's a story that we want to tell. That's a story for Americans. That's a story for Irish people. We wanted again to show how this fed into the bigger picture, what was going on in the world at the time. The rise of socialism. James Connolly, the great socialist leader of the rebellion, he was over here with the Wobblies. He was organizing in New York. He spent four years in the US. He went back. So how does this fit into that, all that socialist uh, ferment that was happening, that was occurring in those early years of the 20th century? How does that fit in there? What about women? What about the suffragettes, women, the, the, the votes for women? Uh, these were quite radical. These people that coalesced in Dublin looking for Irish events were quite radical in many instances. They were also cultural nationalists. They understood the importance of culture uh, before many did. Um, the other aspect, of course, is the whole, uh, the, whole um, the First World War and Irish people who, thinking they were fighting for Irish freedom, entered the British Army, hoping for home rule. After... Uh, a war of independence that followed 1916, war of independence, a vicious civil war, partition. These people were forgotten. They were written out of Irish history. And again, we, we saw it as our, as our duty, I suppose, really, to, to reinsert that, to put back in the bits of history that have been erased. And because, again, because we're doing it 100 years on, uh, we now have, I think we now can have, if you like, the generosity of spirit from all sides, to look at this as history, to look at this in a, kind of in, in, in a more overall fashion, and perhaps to understand the other side. So one of the things we tried to do was that we tried to speak to historians 
who didn't always agree. Their interpretations weren't always the same. But their opinions are based on scholarship. And we didn't try to force anything into some sort of neat box if it didn't go, you know? This is complex. Not everyone is going to agree about what happened in Dublin over the, that week in Easter 1916. Not everyone is going to agree with our analysis of what happened thereafter. But that's okay. What we want to do with this, we want to inform people. Uh, we want to move people. I think we want to place it in its international context to show also how this tiny event in Ireland influenced places as far afield as India. It had a huge impact. Irish nationalism had a huge impact on Indian nationalism. Later on in the 60s, the whole decolonialization movement in Africa. Um, in fact, one of the things I, I just, I've personally I found uh, really quite amazing, actually, moving and amazing and almost bizarre, uh, was we came across a still of, uh, I think it's Kenyatta, in, in, or it's, it's in, a, in Tanzania, the uh, African leader in Tanzania in the 1960s. And they have, uh, he's holding a pla placard which says, freedom for Africa. And it says, Africa will have freedom by hook or by crook. Now, I don't know if any of you get that, but <laughs> Oliver Cromwell, when he was invading Ireland, said he would invade Ireland by hook, which is a small place in County Wexford, where actually I'm from, or by crook, which is in County Cork. So even though we've been saying this, oh yes, like this has had a huge international effect, to actually see with my own eyes this amazing placard with this African people holding up saying, Africa will be free by hook or by crook, you know, and just that. And this thing happened time and time again. It was, it was quite extraordinary. Um, I suppose that's kind of just the overall, what I want to just give you the overall idea of what we were trying to do here. So um, I'd like just to talk briefly about, I suppose, how did we go about that then? Once Chris uh, said yes, uh, once we uh, got the as I say, the, the incredible support of the university. Um, we, we decided then, okay, if we're going to do this, if it's coming out of the university, and again, why did we decide, why did we decide to do a television documentary? Um, and again, I think television is such a potent, and film in general, is such a potent medium. And as a tool in telling history, or a tool in teaching history, or at least opening history to people, to broad audiences, you, you can't find something better. Um, I mean, people can read books, but there's something about that visual medium. I remember, again, what, what inspired me to be a documentary maker, actually, was um, I went to school in, in, uh, in a convent school in County Waterford. Um, and as boarders, we were in sixth year. I was a history, uh, I really was a kind of history buff then. But the nuns allowed us to come down to watch The World at War. I don't know if any of you ever saw that series. It was absolutely incredible. Uh, they did the first one. And you had Laurence Olivier's voice, this incredible voice. And the music, just everything about it. And we were led down darkened corridors down to the music room because it was on late at night. So we had to go up to the dormitories, get all ready for bed, and they let the seniors come down to watch this. But I will never forget it. It was absolutely electrifying. Because here was history, here were people. They were like our ages. We were looking at these young kids talking about what it was like to be in Germany, what it was like to be in France, what it was like to be a young 18-year-old American going on those beaches. It was just absolutely scarifying and scintillating and just and I'm thinking imagine being able to do that imagine being able to have that impact on people letting them access their own history in this very say intimate way and I think television can be very intimate now obviously as well television as a medium has huge drawbacks as everything has oversimplification um, you can very much oversimplify but then you can oversimplify in books you can over you can over go the other way as well and overcomplicate Right, so again, we've got to, I think if, if we're serious academics, we obviously have an educational remit. And for us, we saw this very much as a public service act, that we would take the best scholarship within the university, not simply within this university, but within the top ranking universities throughout the world. So we spoke to people in Harvard and NYU and Boston and Oxford and Cambridge and Aberdeen and Edinburgh, in Dublin and UCD and literally all over. Uh, we have. We have voices here that are American voices, that are English voices, that are uh, Australian voices, Indian voices. Uh, and we tried to capture that. Uh, and we tried to put it over in a very serious way, but also in a way that would be compelling, because we're telling stories. So 
it was a huge responsibility, you know, not to manipulate it, not to ma manipulate these different scholars who trusted us with their, with their interviews. So the first thing that we did was we said, okay, we're, we want to do something that's going to be historically accurate in the first instance. That's the very least we can do. Uh, we don't want this to be something that will come and go. We want this to be something that will, that will at least last 20, 25 years. That will be a pen shot, really for history, that will be an archive itself. That in 50 years' time, when it's 150 years, people can look back and say, oh, that's what they thought then. As we can look back, as we look back at programs that were made, we, we utilized a lot of them actually, ones that were made 50 years ago, the 50th anniversary, when the whole approach to the, to the 1916 Rising within Ireland was one of total celebration. Was These were heroes. Uh, they won freedom for Ireland, and that's that. No questions, nothing about anybody else, nothing about the people who fought in the First World War, nothing about anybody with different opinions. Just that was that, 50 years ago. 75 years after, 25 years after that, the 75th anniversary, no celebration, nothing. No television programs, no marches in Dublin. Amnesia, distaste, discomfort. Why was that? Okay, 66 was the 50th year. 68, 69, 70, the troubles in Northern Ireland. So suddenly saying we want to fight and die for Ireland was a little bit more difficult to say that in 1970 when people were doing that, basically. They were, they were looking back and saying, we are doing what Podrick Pierce did. The Irish government is saying, oh, this is a bit problematic. So in the way that both representations of history on television or in film, and indeed the way the Irish state and indeed many historians were dealing with this suddenly went from hagiography, uncritical hagiography, to either amnesia or demonization. It's revisionism which said that in fact, far from being heroes, these people were violent and that we, they were fascist, violent, whatever, we should really have nothing to do with them. And So now, then we're here 100 years on, 25 years later, 30 years later. But many, many things have happened since. We're in a very different position now than we were at the 75th anniversary. We've been, we're many years in a peace process. And for me, one of the things I think that I suppose was, was most moving was one of the things we found out was 1911, go back to 1911, uh, George V, this is four years before the rising. George V, who had newly crowned uh, King of England, visited Dublin and thousands lined the route, cheering and Union Jacks all over the place and people were wearing. He said, um, as he was leaving, he said he was so thrilled, we are so pleased with our progress through Dublin. Uh, we will return to our Irish subjects imminently. 100 years would pass before a British monarch would come to Dublin. But this time, she would be a queen. She wasn't coming to her subjects. She was coming to a sovereign, independent nation, to her neighbour. And she came, and it was one of the, seriously, it was one of the most moving things I certainly, and I think an awful lot of both Irish and British people uh, 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 found it to be similar. Queen Elizabeth came exactly 2011, exactly 100 years after her great-grandfather. And she visited the Garden of Remembrance in Dublin, Parnell Street in Dublin. Just where, actually, the people that were taken out of the GPO were held overnight by British soldiers and treated quite badly after their surrender. They were kept there overnight. She went up to this Garden of Remembrance and she stood side by side with Mary McAleese, who's been one of, who's, again, was our, my great privilege here to meet here as our visit, one of our visiting professors last semester. She was here with us in the law school and in the institute. She stood as president of Ireland, side by side with Queen Elizabeth, while Queen Elizabeth laid a wreath about her head in honour and memory of the men and women of 1916. Mary McAleese had previously done that at Messine in France when she honoured the sacrifices of men, Irish men, in the British Army during the First World War. So this generosity, this, this not forgetting our history at all, 
not pretending that there weren't differences, but looking at it in a more generous spirit. Um, and hopefully realizing that it's history, you know? That's something that really motivated us here, I think. And, um, I, and I think we've, as I say, I, I certainly hope that, this, that the, these, these films, this film and the documentary series, you know, will help that process of understanding, understanding ourselves, telling our own stories, telling our stories to other people. So, okay, so then what did we do? The first thing we did was we, we researched. Right? We're a university, so we were going to make sure this was going to be properly researched. So we had uh, uh, graduate students uh, go literally into libraries in Ireland, all over America, and look to see, have we missed anything? Is there anything, is there anything that, that has been missed in the past? Um, and there were some things. We went into the, we, we, we put a person into the National Library in Ireland, uh, who were one of our research partners. They were able to help them catalogue things that they didn't know they had. So again, we were able to give that back, even at a very early stage. We could give that to the, to the Irish people. Uh, or to, and to anybody who wants to look up there, they've digitized things based on some of our, our, of our researchers' work. Um, we also went and we interviewed maybe 40 historians on camera, just, just in the very initial stages, just a little small handheld camera. Um, but those conversations, and some of those people appeared on, on the film, some didn't. But all of their contributions, were, they, they were absolutely wonderful because they really pinned us. They, as we were, as I, I was writing a script, getting some kind of script together, um, so that then we, we could then obviously uh, see how we were going to shoot this, what we were going to do with it, how we were going to imagine it visually. Um, but that initial, I think that initial uh, sweep of, 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 our, of scholars was so beneficial, so useful. Um, and so it was a process of maybe about two years of going through all of that. I think I probably read about a thousand books, or thereabouts. <laughs> As I said, we had all these researchers feeding things into us. Um, other things that we had, um, the Bureau of Military History in Ireland. Um, just let me show you, for example. We had access to, um, We had access to things that other, say, 25 years ago, they didn't. Um, in 1966, because 19, 1997, I think, because of the peace process, uh, the, the court martial, the secret court, court's martial, that, ex, that, that sentenced the leaders to death, these were, uh, these were held in secret, and the British never released these because they were, uh, they were afraid of, of being controversial, needless to say. Uh, these were finally released in 97. So again, we've access to those in a way that we didn't have in the past. We also have these, uh, the, in, in um, Ireland in 19, the 1940s, um, the Bureau of Military History um, asked for people, with, people who had been in 1916, either as combatants or had taken part or as witnesses, to give their stories. Um, and they did, they made these sworn statements. So again, we have access to those. You can see there, that's the original uh, Bureau of Military History. Uh, and this is the, the Reverend Father Aloysius, OFM, Capuchin Friary, Church Street. And he was the chaplain to the Irish Volunteer Leaders, 1916. And he gave this uh, in 1942. Um, this is quite extraordinary. I mean, even though they were, these, these, these uh, records were given 20 years after the event, 30 years after the event, they're still first-hand accounts. And they're, they're absolutely fascinating. This was the man who was in it when the, when the leaders were being executed. He was there with them. Um, we also have documents from the, from, from the British side. Major price. We have all of those documents. Um, also, there have been newly released documents from people looking for military pensions. So we have, I mean, in a sense, it's almost an embarrassment of riches. We have thousands, we had thousands of photographs, stills. We also had access to, um, let me show you this. These are some, um, just some raw, kind of raw archive that was, that was shot. Oh, yeah. This was done in 1972. You can bear with this now if it doesn't make shrieking noises. It does make shrieking noises. Okay, sorry, we won't have the shrieking noises. Let me do this one. Okay, here. Um, we, we were able to go to... Uh, 
to um, RTE, basically, to their archives. And some of this stuff has never been seen. In 1966, they did a lot of interviews with people who had moved to This is life. Connolly O'Brien. Could we talk about your father in the middle of his family? Did he play games with the children? Well, I don't think there's so much games as I remember. I remember him wanting us to sing and wanting us to dance and getting us to recite. But uh, I wouldn't say it was games as we understand games nowadays. He had he great powers of concentration. Oh, marvelous, marvelous. In our living room, there was a big, there was a big round table but you used to have our meals on when we had visitors, <laughs> not when the family was there. But um, he used to sit at one side of it, writing. Others at the, uh, around the other corners of it doing their homework. And there'd be some sitting on, playing some game, at the fa sitting on the hot rug of the fire. And he'd work away through all this din and talk and everything else. And if you wanted to get his attention, you had to go over and touch him. It would absolutely cut that all out. Any favourites in the family? That was Nora Connolly O'Brien, the daughter of James Connolly. And there's a piece where she uh, talks about <clears throat> when he was in, he was shot, uh, he was unable to stand and he was taken to hospital, but he was court-martialed and sentenced to death. The executed, the to be executed, were allowed to have a last visit with their families. So when the family w was called for it, they knew what it was. And she talks here on screen about what that was like. But her mother, she and her mother, been taken by the British across Dublin, down O'Connell Street, which was still smouldering. And she talks about how the, the eerie feeling and the smell of, of smoke and cordite in the streets. And th the mother goes in and... and, and uh, he says to James Connolly says to his wife, "Well, you know, Lily, what this is about." And she says, "Oh no, James! Oh no, your beautiful life, James." And to see his daughter tell this, it's it's, it's quite extraordinary. We also have British soldiers uh, who were uh, who were in Dublin. Many of them didn't even know they were. They, they thought they were in France. And again, we have these these squaddies coming from eighteen-year-olds coming the Sherwood Foresters, who didn't even, they'd never shot a gun before. When they were being uh, disembarked at Kingstown Harbour, which is then Kingstown Harbour, now Dunlira, uh, their sergeant got them to fire into the, into, the, into the sea because they'd never actually fired a gun before. And then within three hours of them arriving, 120 of them were dead, shot to death on a bridge, as they kept, again, almost... In, in almost what uh, a dress rehearsal for what would happen later in France. Just wave after wave being shot back. Four volunteer, IRA volunteers uh, ambushed them on, on this bridge. They just kept coming. So those, uh, and of course you get here, I think, too, on all sides. You know, you see on all sides the horror of war, actually. Um, and you also get to what, I mean, also the motivations. This wasn't totally just senseless either at that level. Um, you get the whole idea, I think, here too, of, of the proclamation of those ideas, of those ideals that people in Ireland had learned from France, had learned from the US. And that comes across very much, I think, in our contributors. Um, so basically, we, have, we had incredible, incredible materials at our disposal. We also decided not to do any reconstructions because we already had these wonderful first-hand accounts. Um, what we decided to do was we shot contemporary footage, we shot new segments, and used that creatively in a contemporary way. So when we're talking about the GPO back in 1916, we're looking at the GPO today. When we're talking about the Irish people, we're looking at the Irish people today. When we're talking about New York, we're looking at it today as well. Africa, the same thing. India, we went and we shot in India. We went to uh, uh, the First World War graves. That was quite an amazing thing when we were talking about the First World War. So. I think we've managed to put something together that I think is fairly special. I, I, I certainly hope it is. And um, what I would like to do is, um, is to show you, basically, uh, a three-and-a-half-minute taster that we've put together, um, hopefully, which will hopefully whet your appetites for the real thing. As I say, we also have a companion book that, that Notre Dame Press are bringing out, where, again, we have very much access to these first-hand accounts 
you know, we'll have a narrative, but then, again, just to hear from all sides, you know. Um, I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's pretty special. Um, so, uh, I'll take questions, obviously, when we just look at this clip. Um, and again, this, I think, brings out, again, I suppose, the international aspect, the Irish-American aspect of it. Thank you all very much for listening. Sorry, I've got to just get rid of this. John, am I doing something wrong with this, do you think? Easter Monday, April 1916. A small band of rebels, including poets and teachers, actors and workers, gathers in Dublin, intent on establishing an independent Irish Republic and bringing about an end to 700 years of British rule. The plan is to take control of key locations throughout the city before the British have time to act. Britain is engaged in war in Europe, where its army of millions, including 200,000 Irishmen, are suffering casualties on an unprecedented scale. Britain's distraction presents the rebels with an opportunity and a glimmer of hope. And you can almost feel in 1916, the clock of civilization is beginning to turn and the old British empire is beginning to come apart at the seams. The Irish see what's going on in Ireland as being part and parcel of things that are happening through this world, that a new world is coming into being. And America was a part of that. And so when the emigres head over to America, they're not going to a foreign land. They're going to a land that they want Ireland to ultimately be. What they brought with them was this hunger for freedom. They saw it here in the United States. They are looking at Ireland from an American perspective, and they've imbibed something of this can-do mentality which is already part of the American psyche. This is the seedbed, in many ways, of 1916. As the men and women of 1916 take on the might of the British Empire, their leaders are aware that they have little hope of success. And yet, the time has come. The most momentous week in Irish history is about to begin. There is an element of deep historical self-consciousness where they stand in the centuries of Irish history and the historic moment that they are creating. A republic had been proclaimed, and there was simply no way that the British government could tolerate a republic on its doorstep. Britain pours 20,000 troops into the city to put down the poorly armed band of 2,000 rebels. Britain's military might is about to be directed on Dublin. In many ways, the purpose of the Rising was not to win, it was to lose. Pierce imagined executions as a great rebel weapon. Yes, they'll kill us, but our fame will live on. The Rising is quickly followed by the Russian Revolution of 1917. Lenin noticed the modernity and the theater of it. Americans can understand struggling and fighting for independence. The New York Times devoted 14 days to the Easter Rising on its front page. After six days of fighting against 20,000 British troops, the rebels are forced to surrender. Yet their actions will change the course of Irish history, and their vision, enshrined in the proclamation, will in time inspire freedom movements around the world. I forgot to mention that we... <laughs> Thanks. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that we used a, a 
a kind of not very well-known actor to do the narration for us. <laughs> we decided to give him a chance, you know. And uh, we also have, I, and I have to draw attention to, it comes across a little bit there, but we have an incredibly, an incredible newly composed score uh, by an Irish composer called Patrick Cassidy. I don't know if any of you saw Calvary, the movie Calvary. Yeah, he did, he wrote the, he wrote the, uh, the score for that. And it's really, I mean, it's heartbreaking, actually. He took Misha Era, and you will have known of the earlier Misha Era, Sean O'Reilly did an incredible score called Misha Era to the first documentary done in 1964. But this is the actual words of Pierce's poem that, uh, Frank, that Frank Cassidy, or Patrick, sorry, Patrick Cassidy, has put to a new, a new classical idiom in a traditional form, if you know what I mean. And he got a, he got a young woman who is 16 years of age. She's a cousin of his. She is, half her family are from Ross Muck in the Connemara Gaeltacht. The other half are from the Philippines. And she just typifies modern Ireland. I mean, it's, it's quite extraordinary. But to hear her, she's a native Irish speaker, singing this, Pierce's words, in this incredible, ancient, modern, totally modern way, it's just, and uh, there will be a soundtrack available, but he's done an incredible job for us. And again, it's just that added thing, you know, when you add layer upon layer upon layer, Liam Neeson's voice. He's been remarkable, and he's been such a supporter of this project from the word go since Chris phoned up and he said, yeah. And he's telling his agent, we were with him in New York, and he said, guy, this is the real thing. This is the real deal. You know, he's been hugely supportive of this project. He said, you know, this is his history too. So um, I'm perfectly happy to ask, answer any questions if he has a question. What was the importance of uh, uh, Double Era not being executed? Oh, they made a big mistake. <laughs> in fact, there's a story that when they were going through the list, because, and again, you know this thing, oh, oh the, you know, the, the British were, if it had been the Germans, they would probably have executed 150, never mind 16, you know? So, I mean, in one level, it was, it was overkill, in one sense, but in another sense, this was the middle, the middle of, of the First World War. But what they did, because they were trying to, in their own lights, they were trying to, stamped down on the ringleaders without going too far, without, without losing hearts and minds. Of course, they did lose hearts and minds. But um, when, they were, when Maxwell was going, he asked his aide de camp, they were going through the list, he said, who's next? And he said, oh, this fellow called De Valera. Well, is he, do you think he's important? Oh, no, he said, not at all. So, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, a, that was uh, uh, he came back to bite them. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's debated, actually. Some people say it was, some people say it wasn't. Because he wasn't the only one, remember, he wasn't the only one uh, to, be, uh, to have his sentence commuted to life imprisonment, many. Uh, Constance, Countess Markovich, the most prominent woman activist, um, while they absolutely detested her because she was a traitor to her class, and they said she, was, she, she had bloody hands and, and wanted to execute her, but they couldn't because obviously they didn't want to be seen to be executing a woman. And they, in fact, said her death sentence was commuted solely and exclusively on account of her sex. Um, also, W.T. Cosgrove, who was uh, one of the, president, the president of the Free State, he also had a sentence commuted. He was rather an unlikely rebel, but he still had been sentenced. To so, so there were many commu uh, commutations. That was probably, that could have been an aspect of it, but um, again, as I say, historians are not quite agreed in that. Of course, Tom Clark was also an American citizen. That didn't stop them executing Tom Clark. Yeah, they, 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 they shot him, yes. Question and a comment. Is Liam Neeson from Northern Ireland? He is. Liam Neeson is from Ballymena. I think Johnny Carson one night, and maybe it was toward the end of the troubles or whatever, they tried to get them to talk about it. So you understand I can't talk about this. We certainly can't talk about this on television. I have very mixed, I think he's a very mixed thing. I don't want to be misquoted. But I take it he came freely and, and wholeheartedly to be able to narrate this. Well, yes, because, because again, this is not partisan, you know? Precisely. Precisely, that this is not partisan. This is trying to tell, this, tell our history. And, um, you know, we're not trying to Brit bash. We're not trying to... Um, revise and be sort of saying that the men of 1916 or the women of 1916 were wrong or more. You know, we're trying to look at this as history. Give, get, let historians give their opinion, give their opinions on things. And um, we can't ignore our history. Being ignorant of our history or, or, or pretending it didn't happen 
that's not the way forward, you know. If we, if, we, if we have some understanding of people's motivations on all sides, I think, it can help us perhaps move on in a more peaceful way. That would be my hope. And given, as I say, given that we're 100 years on now, um, I think that's one of the reasons why, for example, Liam Neeson uh, agreed to do this. And he, he very much liked our approach. Oh yes, and I think he would have to. You know, his, um, uh, I think his family background is Catholic from a, from a quite a, a Protestant area in Balamina. But again, he's, he hasn't. He's never come out and talked about things like that at all. And I think, as I say, I think he he, he very much appreciated our uh, balance. Is a horrible word in terms of documentary. I hate it. But we were trying to be as fair as we could, you know, and as balanced in that in that as, in so far as anyone can be balanced about history. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Sure. What's been the British response to your project? Really open. In fact, we've probably as many British historians on this as we have Irish. In fact, probably more. In fact, probably, in fact I got one stage when I was going through, I said, oh, my God, we need a few Irish voices in here. You know? <laughs> um, in fact, we're, we're also, the BBC, are, well, I don't want to say because they haven't signed on the line yet, but uh, we're just waiting to get them the final cut. I mean, the final cut's finished. It's just we're waiting for some uh, archive to put in, uh, high-res archive. But um, <clears throat> very, very open. Uh, and, and again, because it's, it's British history. You know, this is, this was, we said it very much, this is, this is a history of an event that is Irish and British and American and indeed European. And, and look at, to look at it in that way. I mean, it, it was the first, the beginning of the dissolution of the British Empire. That's a British story. So um, as I say, we hope to have it on, it's, it's going to be on either BBC Two or BBC Four. So we're, we're really, really pleased with that. Also Canada, also Australia. And New Zealand. <laughs> oh, right. Chris is advising this, yeah. Because obviously Ken Burns is one of our, you know, he was one of my heroes. And he was also, you know, very much in the back of, in our minds. Not that we wanted to imitate what Ken Burns did, because you couldn't, but that we would do something similar, you know. Uh, an imitation is the sincerest is it the form of flattery. Um, so Chris and I are in New York to meet Liam Neeson. Uh, to do the recording of the VO. Vox uh, City Voice, a small old studio. And um, I'm in, I get, get in the script, looking at all, they have a display camera, and Ken Burns' the Civil Wars are there. He says, oh, that's been that was recorded here, in the same studio. So he called me and he said, come on, wait, look, all Ken Burns stuff, that's all been done here, right? And uh, the lady on the desk, who was a really, really nice woman, she said, uh, oh yeah, she said, uh, Ken's in the next room, would you like to meet him? <laughs> he was in doing Vietnam, his new, his new doc. And he came out and he met us and we, we had coffee with him every morning. We were breaking at the same times and it was just extraordinary. We just thought, yeah, this is, you know, something is all coming, this is synchronicity, you know. Uh, he did, he wanted to meet Liam Neeson and of course we, we were happy to, uh, we were happy to oblige. Um, yeah, it's been, it was, it's been a terrific experience, obviously, you know, and um, where else would you get this opportunity but at Notre Dame? Oh, yeah, there's one other thing that we're doing, obviously, because this is, this is a film, obviously, it's, it's outreach, we're, I mean, we're a university, but one of the things we're going to do uh, on the back of this, I suppose, uh, or to, to use this to propel other th things, uh, we're going to literally bring this through over the 18-minute version to universities and different places throughout the world. We're going to Australia, New Zealand, we're going to South America. It's at invitation. We're going all over Britain, in fact. We're going to Oxford, Cambridge, um, Edinburgh, Manchester, our global gateway in London as well, uh, and other places. Um, all over Europe. We've just been asked, by the way, Chris, you don't know this, but we've been asked to Serbia. We've been asked to the University of Belgrade. Uh, Budapest, Paris, Monaco, literally all over the world, all over the US as well to do questions and answer sessions, to do screenings of this, questions and answer sessions. We're calling this reframing 1916. So reframing it in a way that we're able to look forward as well as backward. So people that are, have, that are interested in Irish studies, that we will get those universities to put up panels. Panels. Are we bringing our own faculty over there? We're going to engage with people in all these different countries. And again, show that we are, you know, we are what we say we are. We're trying to lead. We're trying to, we're trying to promote Irish studies throughout the world. And this, we think, was, we thought this was a really suitable vehicle. And we've had incredible response. So we've a lot of uh, legwork to do next year, Chris. 
Uh, but it's again, it's hugely exciting to be able to do this and to be able to bring the University of Notre Dame and this fantastic project uh, to other universities throughout the world and other area studies programs. Yeah. Do you have any footage on the hierarchy of Ireland versus the hierarchy in America, the church reaction to this? Um, we've dealt with some of it. I mean, the, 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 the church's reaction is quite interesting in Ireland, I think, and also in the States, because they went from being very initially anti-Republican, obviously, they were, they were the, 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 the Bishop Moriarty of Kerry famously said of the Fenians that hell was not hot enough nor eternity long enough to punish these miscreants. <laughs> Fifty years later, in 1917, they're having masses. And we do certainly go into that, how within a very short period of time, the Catholic Church, that, these, that the, 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 dead, the dead leaders are basically beatified. You know, they, and it, it's, it's very much a Catholic process. That while they necessarily, they were, they were, they were, the leaders were very Catholic, many of them. But there was also an anti-clerical, people like Tom Clark, the old Fenians. Certainly the bishops wouldn't have looked at those with any great uh, warmth. But within six months, within a year, that had totally changed. So we do, yes, we definitely go into, the, uh, in, into that. We, again, it's, if we've three hours to tell this very, very complex story. And it's like, where do you begin? One of the questions, one of the hardest things was, where do you start? Do we start in 11, in, in, in 1169, in the 12th century? When do we start? When do you start the story? And more importantly, when do you end the story? Do we come up to the present day? So we did a bit of both, you know, we did a little bit of cheating. Uh, we, in, in the three part, we bring it up to the present day. In the 80 minute, we sort of finish. We, we, we reference what happens after, but we kind of finish in 1918. It's sort of a logical finish. But yeah, it's a complex story that goes on, but that's, that's a fascinating. That could take a whole documentary series in and of itself. I think it's going to play out much, in a much more positive way, I think. Um, I think what the Irish government, state have done this time is, 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 is very interesting. They got a lot of stick last year when they came out with their, with their program. They quickly, they said, oh, we're doing something wrong. So they, they got a guy in to basically to um, work across from the ground up, energize people at the ground level. Uh, liaise with all the different state organizations, cultural organizations. Uh, they, they appointed a, 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 an expert group of historians to advise them. So what they did was, I think it's quite interesting, they decided, because the whole thing, of course, is within the whole framework now of the peace process, of reconciliation, of uh, respect for, for, for varying traditions in Ireland, the unionist tradition as well as the nationalist tradition as well as the republican tradition. So. They decide, and again, this, is, this has not been without, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a controversial, right? it's still a very controversial issue. So what did they decide to do was not simply look at the centenary in and of itself. They situated the centenary in what they call a decade of commemorations. So that began in 2013, 1913, 2013, the lockouts. So they were able to look at what happened in the lockout, the whole socialism, all of that. Then, at the moment, for example, they're looking, they'll be looking at the Somme as well. They looked at um, uh, the, the events in, 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 in Ulster. So they, it, they, they have it as a more, as a, as an ongoing thing that it will allow them, I suppose, to, to, to commemorate and to question in, in a broader way than they would have done before. So that's how they're hoping. They've also, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're generated huge interest from the ground up. You know, they had, they had public meetings all over the country and people came up with all these ideas that, you know, the, the local Boy Scouts were going to plant trees or they're going to, that level of, of, of thing that people would, they would, they're also um, getting all the school children in Ireland to rewrite the proclamation. Yeah, what would you do? And so there, those, these proclamations were put up. They have the national flag. They, have, they had um, the Irish army going around to schools to give them the flag to explain what the flag, the Irish tricolour means. That, that it was the orange and the green and the, the white was the peace. So they have them going on how to respect the flag, that this was something that was to be respected, not to be used in some sort of... In, so that, just from those tiny little things up to uh, big major... Uh, on Easter Monday, in fact, there's a big public celebration for the people. They have people dressing up at the time, and they have historical pageants and all of that sort of thing. So I think it's going to be quite exciting, actually. 
One of the things they're doing, which um, involves us, actually, is they are showing the 80-minute version at a big state event in the National Concert Hall in Dublin on St. Patrick's Eve, the 16th of March next year. And the National Concert Orchestra will play the score live. Liam Neeson will emcee it. The President of Ireland will be in attendance. And then they're going to beam that live to as many embassies as they can within the... They're going to beam it live to London. It's going to be shown in London, in the Irish, in, uh, through the Irish Embassy in London at a, in a movie house. It's going to be shown in Belgrade, in Athens, in Paris, all over Europe. Um, and then they're going to put it as out later on in the, all over the States and in other countries throughout the world. So that's our little contribution to it. You know, we're very pleased. Yeah. Great place to be for uh, Easter 2016, I think. There'll be a few parties going on. Uh, sure. Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, sorry. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Boy Scouts planting trees. Yeah. There's a tree I wanted to bring up. It was uh, Eamon de Valera. Yeah. The tree of Liberty. Is there any news there? Uh, or, you know, well, there's an article I'd cite from uh, the Irish America magazine that talked about it and sort of lamented that uh, been uprooted, you know, sh shortly after him leaving, and uh, if there was any news there, if there was any uh, talk about getting that rectified and getting a tree planted. Do you know, that's a great idea. Let's, uh, Chris, do you hear that? that we should re, um, given that they're planting trees, the Boy Scouts, we should get maybe a few Girl Scouts over here to, uh, to plant a tree uh, in place of the, root, the one that was uprooted, De Valera's tree, that will do a new tree of liberty. Great idea. Yeah, let's, uh, let's run with that one. Okay, I think my time is up, Peter, is it? Ready? Does anybody else want to talk? Well, we're Don't, have a, sorry, that way, yeah, there, Yes, it certainly will be. If you look, we have a website. Mary, is Mary there? Mary, we have our website coming up, haven't we? Mary? Is Mary there? She's gone. Yeah, we, if you go on, go on to Keo Nocton, we're going to have a dedicated website live in the next couple of days. Uh, you will have all of the information there. Uh, and as soon as we get information about local broadcasts, for example, and public television, that will be posted there. All of the events and the reframing will be posted there. All of the gala screenings, because the Irish, Irish consulates throughout the US also are doing some gala screenings. For example, we have one in Atlanta on the 15th, and they'll be open to the public. Various places throughout the states, Washington, D.C., for example. So that will all be available. All that information will be available on our website through Keo Oh, Chicago. There will also be in the Siskel Theatre in Chicago on... What date's that? In 24th of April. 24th of March, I beg your pardon, 24th of March, in the Siskel in Chicago, uh, again, hosted by the Irish Consul General there. So that will be, they the, the, the around the States, and you can, we'll keep you in touch via our website. Oh, we also had students, by the way, because we're a university and we like our students. We had our students working on this as interns, our undergraduate students as interns. They were over in Dublin during the production, and they were great. They, they made their own little movie, Behind the Scenes, which is available on YouTube, actually. Graduate students involved, we had our own undergraduates as well from both FTT and studies. So that was terrific. Courses here as well, using this as a basis. Our marketing students had a competition as well, our undergraduate marketing students in the Mendoza College of Business. So we've managed to involve quite a number of the university uh, fellows, faculty, and students. So thanks, Peter. Remember that when Father uh, Soren, the news of the burning of the main building, he apologized for having dreamt too small. <laughs> Nobody could ever uh, accuse anybody connected with the Keogh <laughs> Institute of dreaming too small. And I have to admit, when Chris Fox first told me about these plans, I said, it's a wonderful plan, but you'll never raise the money, you'll never find the support. Of course I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this is Notre Dame, and it's going to be a wonderful contribution by Notre Dame to the Rethinking the history of Ireland. Thank you, Brina. Thanks, Peter. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you.